So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, something a little personal, a little close to home, but I believe it's really important. I believe that uh, right now we are in a situation especially where this message is needed, but I want to start it with a few verses. I'm going to start it first off with uh, a verse that, from John chapter 14, verse 6, and this is something that Jesus said, and I love the fact that uh, um, Tammy said it earlier, but it says, I am, Jesus is saying, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. What I want us to pick out of this verse here real quick is that truth, um, oh man, I, I got it backwards, sorry. This is what Tammy said, John chapter 8, verse 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So what I wanted to point out of that verse is that truth requires truth, and then later on in, in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So since Jesus is the truth, and the truth is Jesus, we can take those two words, and we can actually use them interchangeably when we read some of these verses, right? So with that in mind, if you go back to John 8, 32, you, you can read it as you will also know the truth, and Jesus will set you free. Jesus requires truth, right? And so um, with that being said, is that today, that's what I want to do. I want to tell you some truth about myself and, and, and things that have been going on in our life and some truth so that somebody else in effect of that can be set free. Because it's easy to teach and preach a sermon that can have people walking away and, and turning off you know, the TV when it comes a time that has you feeling good, but you, you need to experience freedom. And then so today that's what I'm after. I'm after some freedom for some people because I believe that we are in a time where a lot of us are bound, right? And here's the problem that I think we have is that when we are bound and when, we, when life goes into these kind of desperate times, we tend to draw back. And I see this a lot happening in, uh, youth, in our youth ministry, for example. There's, you know, a certain person will come and they'll be faithful and coming for a while and they're engaged and they're progressing and then all of a sudden they kind of fall off the map and you don't see them anymore. And I can, 100% of the time, almost 100% of the time, I can guarantee that there's something going on in their life that is causing them to draw back and draw away. And I'm guilty of doing this myself. I do it sometimes, and I think that we all do it. That when, when certain situations in life and, and are, are weighing against you, you kind of draw back and you, you, you kind of become a little secretive about the things that are going on in your life. Um, and so I'm going to tell you something, hoping that some of you will experience some freedom today. There's a, a few months back, um, pre, before June, a few months back, there was an evening where Kristen and I were sitting on our couch in our living room. And, uh, and Kristen was sitting there, and she, was, uh, she had exploded varicose veins in her legs that she got from um, just having kids. And so these veins in her legs were just malfunctioning and they were causing her grief. And so a year actually before that time, we had gone to um, uh, a consultation appointment of what it would look like to get rid of this, this problem. And they told us that it, you'd, they, you'd have to have them lasered and it's gonna cost $5,000, right? But we don't, we don't really have $5,000 readily available. I don't know what your situation is, but our situation is that that's a huge amount of money for us to draw out of and, and to just have. And so she's sitting on the couch. I'm, I'm, I, I notice um, that she's being hurt and I feel bad. And then she looks at me and she says, you really need to get some new glasses. At the time, the glasses that I had, uh, the, both the arms had independently at one time or the other, they had fallen off and they were super glued on. The protective coating, the, like the anti-scratch coating that was on the glasses had worn away about a year and a half prior. And so there are so many scratches in my glasses that it was almost like looking through a potato chip, right? I was in almost, almost a constant pain in my eyes of like they were being strained and I would have these headaches and it was getting real bad. Sometimes I remember I would just take my glasses off, uh, even though I wouldn't be able to see as much, just so that I could see what it looked like to not be looking through all these scratches. Uh, and then another thing that happened to us is that the, and, and again, this might sound ridiculous, but it, it's where I was at. This is the first year we've ever had to pay taxes. And uh, so we went into our tax year thinking that we'd be good. And then 
they came back to us saying that we had to pay in taxes the exact same amount that it was going to cost for me to get a new pair of glasses. The glasses that I'd bought uh, were about $700 because my prescription is so heavy. And so now I was going to have to spend the money anyway, but I still wouldn't get glasses out of it. Another thing, again, not, I'm not going to be piling everything on, but uh, ICBC had sent us a letter. They said, hey, your house is old, which it is. Your house is old. We're going to be sending uh, an inspector through who's going to take pictures. We just want to make sure that we're charging you the right amount for your house insurance, which because it's ICBC, in my mind, I was like, okay, they're just going to charge me more for house insurance now because there's a lot of things currently that are falling apart and just not going well at the house. Our hot water tank and our furnace are both miraculously living past their expiry dates. And just things like that. So there's this moment where Kristen and I were sitting on the couch and we have this letter from ICBC in front of us. We have our taxes thing in front of us. And it was overwhelming. There were so many things that needed to our, our, our money and needed our attention and we just couldn't keep up. And I was frustrated. I was ashamed that I, I wasn't able to, I'm not going to be able to make ends meet, and I wasn't going to be able to make those ends meet on my own. I was ashamed that I didn't have some kind of, uh, or I was embarrassed that I didn't have some kind of skill that would allow me to, you know, just say, okay, cool, like we can, we can just pay that five grand, it's fine, we'll save it up, it'll take a couple months, or it's just sitting there in the savings account that we just don't have. Right? And, and so I was embarrassed, and I didn't really want to share that with anybody. And, but Kristen and I were, were, were stressed, and we were overwhelmed um, in our situation. And we really we were desperate, and we felt like we couldn't keep up. And I know that I'm not the only one who's had these moments, that we, at times, all come to a place in our life where the pressure is just cracking us. It's like it's, it's so heavy on us, and we're just going to break, and we're crumbling over it. I don't know if yours is a financial one or if you're having issues with health or if you have been caught up in some sin that you just can't shake or if you're really battling some kind of depression or anxiety, but there's something that might be happening in your life today that makes you feel like you cannot keep up. You've got this issue staring you in the face and there's no way for you to overcome it. And that's what we're going to dig into a little bit today. So our story is going to pick up in uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 2 to 7, and it reads, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Leave this place and go east. Hide near the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan River. You can get your water from that stream, and I have commanded ravens to bring you food there. So Elijah did what the Lord told him, and he went to live near the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan River. Ravens brought him food every morning and every evening. He drank water from the stream, and um, I, yeah, that's what it says. And so the, what's happening, a little bit of context here, is that the nation of Israel has kind of fallen away from God. And they've trusted in Baal, which was known to them as the god of um, rain, and f for their, you know, sustenance for their reign. And so what God is saying through Elijah, he's like, I'm going to prove to my nation Israel that I am in control of everything. And so through Elijah, Elijah stands in front of King Ahab and he says, there's not going to be any rain until I say so. Because God's not going to send rain until I say so, until God tells me to tell you to say so. And so God has him flee for his life, and he says, go run and be by this, this brook in the wilderness. So Elijah runs, and he goes to the brook, and the brook is there, and ravens are bringing him food, which is totally miraculous, and it shows that God really is in control of everything. And so this, this little brook is giving him life, right? And he's not really at this point in his, uh, in his journey, I guess you could say, in an ideal situation, but at least he's being sustained, right? But watch this. You read on to verse 7. It says that uh, there was no rain, so after a while, his brook dried up. What's up with that? Could you imagine? God calls you to something. He says, there's going to be a drought, but you can go over here. I'm going to provide for you in this way. So you go. You go to the brook, and now your, your brook is gone. It's dried up. I don't know about how you would act in that situation, but I would have some questions for God. Right? And that what happens is when things go bad in our life, we tend to ask God, like, 
do you care? Don't you hear for me? Right? Like, aren't you here for me? Because I, you, I, this, is, this was my thing. This was, was going to give me life, and now it's gone. But I don't think that that's the way that Elijah reacted. At least that's not the way that the Bible says that he did, that he reacted. Because I think that what hap- our frustration comes because we think that the brook is what gives us life. But Elijah understood something, right, that I needed to learn back in my moment that I had a while ago, is that there's a difference between what is your source and there's a difference and what is your channel, right? So Elijah understood that God was his source, but that the brook was never his source. So when it dried up, that means that the channel dried up, but God would be opening another channel for him. So there's no need to panic. But that's not the way that I was reacting in my situation. You see, my channel and the things that were, you know, uh, for, for financially supporting us weren't going to be enough to, for our need. And I was panicking over this. But what my issue was is that in my heart, I had relied on my channel to be my source rather than God as my source. And maybe, maybe you're in the same Maybe you're in the same situation. You're confusing your source and your channel. Maybe you lost your job because of the whole pandemic. You lost your job because of coronavirus. You had to go on curb and that's not enough to live. Maybe you're having health issues that you can't control. Things are just seem to be just coming at you one after the other and, and there's nothing you can do. You're out of your control. What does your source say? In Hebrews 3, 5, God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Psalm 121, 5 said, the Lord is your keeper. Psalm 23, 2, he makes you lie down in green pastures. Psalm 37, 25, I was young and now I'm old and never have I seen the righteous forsaken. Right? We can rely on God as our source, but at times we get wandered off and we get carried away and we start to look at a channel as our source. An example of this could be that right now one of the channels in my life is New Life Church. This is my full-time job and this is what I do. But if for some reason tomorrow that was to be taken away from me, right? whatever circumstance would happen that's like, hey, we just can't we can't have you guys at the church anymore. This is your last paycheck. We're sorry, right? Theoretically, in my mind, this is how I should feel. I should be well, like, that's okay. This brook is drying up, but New Life Church is never my source. God is my source. And if the channel dries up over here, that's fine. God's going to open a new channel somewhere else. And that's what happens in our story. Verse 8 to 9, the Lord said to Elijah, Go to Zarephath in Sidon, and stay there. There was a widow there that I have commanded to take care of you. So there's a new channel opened up for Elijah, and not really a conventional one at that, right? Like you imagine, you know, he's in the brook living in a time where um, women aren't really allowed to work. It's really hard for them to provide for themselves in that culture at that time. And God says, hey, a widow is going to take care of you, which really naturally seems pretty impossible. But here's, the, here's what I want us to get from this, is that I think a lot of times we are too panicked, too worried, too stressed to take the time to stop and to hear God's voice. If your channel's dried up, if you find yourself in this desperate, crazy situation, and there's no, there's no outcome, you can't see how, how you're going to get through it, you can't see the other side, it's not that God doesn't have one, it's that we haven't slowed down long enough to hear what it is from God. Because I guarantee you that it's probably going to be somewhat ridiculous, and it might even be miraculous, where it's just, it comes out of the blue and you don't understand it. But he has always a channel for you, and we, we end up panicking over that because we don't take the time, we slow down to hear God's voice. What is it that you have for us? Like Elijah did. He was slow enough, and he took the time to hear God say, this is where you're going. So, um, verse 10, we'll, con- we'll continue on, says that Elijah went to Zarephath, and I thought, and he went to the town gate, and he saw a woman there gathering wood for a fire. She was a widow, um, and Elijah said to her, would you bring me a small cup of water to drink? Zarephath is a long way. If you can find it on a map from where 
the brook was, and I think it's pretty funny that he gets there and the first thing he wants is some water, right? Like there's a drought, his brook dried up, he's got to travel forever, you know, what it seems like. I'm sure it took a couple days. He gets there and you can see this like desperation, like, oh, please give me some water, right? And that's the first thing he asked. I thought that was kind of funny, but we'll go on. Verse 11, as she was going to get the water, Elijah said to her, bring me a piece of bread too, please. So, I believe at this moment, she was faced with a choice, right? Do I leave this guy, some random stranger I don't know, and just go back and, and come out, you know, to, to do what I'm doing here later? Or do I actually tell him what's going on in my life? Because what we're going we're gonna to find out here is that Though she's talking to Elijah, it's God talking through Elijah. So really this widow is having a conversation with God and she has a choice. Am I really, am I going to be honest and am I going to be truthful with what is going on in my life to God or am I going to go hide? Because often we have that temptation to go hide. But unless we're truthful and honest with what's going on to God, he can't really do anything because we're not permitting him to work in our lives. And she's faced with this decision. And this is what happened. Then the woman answered, being truthful, she says, I promise you, before the Lord your God, I have nothing but a handful of flour of jar and a little bit of olive oil in the jug. I came here today to gather a few pieces of wood for a fire to cook our last meal. My son, which we understand would have been a younger son, and I We'll eat it, and then we're going to die from hunger. No doubt, at this point, Elijah understands what it is that is happening with this woman. Her situation is already bad. Her husband is dead. Whatever ways, whatever channels she had through him providing for them, those have dried up and they're gone, right? And now to make her matters worse, a drought has come, and leaving her extremely, extremely desperate. Says that, the Bible says that she's gathering some sticks and she's, gonna, she's got a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil left. There's finite resources and that she is going to cook her last meal and die. So how that relates to me and my story is that I, I, it's not like I don't have um, any, any money or any way to, to do something. There's always something that you can do. Because you're never fully, fully desperate where there's absolutely nothing you can do. There's always something that you can do. And, uh, and, and it, 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 I always thought, we'll read this next part. Um, this part was, I always thought this part was kind of crazy. Verse 13 and 14. Then Elijah said to the woman, don't worry. Go home and cook. Uh, cook your food as you have said. But first, make a small piece of bread for me with the flour that you have and bring it to me. Then cook something for yourself and for your son. I always thought that was kind of, I don't know if ambitious is the right word. You know what I'm saying? But this, this widow confesses to having nothing. And what's the first thing that he does? And he's like, cool, cool. I understand that you have nothing. But I still want you to cook me something first and then go cook something for yourself and your son. He's asking her at this moment to go against every instinct that she has, every maternal instinct that she has to provide for her kid and to put him, to put him first. And this seems kind of like an audacious and ridiculous. But I found that, and like, what is he doing, really? And, and it seems the same way in my situation that God was doing this in my life. God, I'm desperate. God, you know, Kristen is in pain and she needs, she needs the surgery. I can't see properly, God, right? Like out of my glasses. And, and now I got to pay the, the same amount to, to taxes. And, you know, and then now we've we got, never mind all the house stuff, never mind all the stress that just comes along with just living in a pandemic, a lot of us are burnt out already, right? And, and, and we, our ability to handle extra little things that happen in life is even lesser than normal. And we're lethargic and we're tired and we're scared and we're worried all the time. And so what, what about all that, God? I'm, I'm at the end of, of 
everything that I can do, and, he, and you're going to ask me? You're going to ask me for something? It seems ridiculous and illogical for me to offer something to you. But what Elijah's doing at this point is that he's not, he's not really after her bread. I'm sure there are other ways that he can go about in his day and, and find something to provide for himself. Uh, or some way to keep feeding himself and for some way to sustain himself. What Elijah is really after is he's after this woman's heart. He's after this widow's heart. God was really after my heart. He saw, Elijah sees in the widow, that she has confused her channel for her source. She's confused the channel for her source, just like I had. And he goes on saying, The Lord, the God of Israel, says that the jar of flour will never be empty, and the jug will always have oil in it. This will continue until the day the Lord sends rain to the land. We all know the promises of God. I've read them. Uh, I read a few here. I'll never leave you off or forsake you. I'll make you lie down in green pastures. And I think we can come to a Sunday service, and, and we can feel like our problems have, have kind of lifted from us, right? We could feel like um, you know, for, for a little bit, for the brief period of time when you're at church, that you have this peace. But for me, the problems that I have, they're waiting for me in the parking lot after I, I leave today. And then so we can, we can hear this, and we can anchor to it. We can be at church on Sunday. We could be like, yes, God, this is so good. You're so good. But when it comes to that problem staring us in the face, it's a little harder to, to remember these and to apply these in your life and to really believe them. Where you're, where you're, you're so desperate, you, you don't know where God is, and you're wondering, how are you going to provide for me? How are you going to do this? But we're all faced with the same choices and the same options that this woman is faced with. Um, going on, verse 15 and 16 says, So the woman went and did what Elijah told her to do. And Elijah, the, the <laughs> reading is hard sometimes. So the woman went and did what Elijah told her to do. Elijah, the woman and her son, had enough food for a long time. And the jar of flour and the jug of oil were never empty. And this happened just as the Lord God had said through Elijah. And so a miracle comes on the house of this widow. Elijah comes in and he says, feed me first. And I give you this promise of God that he is going to be your provider. He is going to be your source. He is going to be your keeper. And she had a decision to make in faith that required a physical action for her to do it. First, she had to be honest and truthful about what was really going on. And second, she had a choice to make in the physical. For us, what it was is that uh, we needed to, we realized that we, we weren't being as faithful with our tithe as we could have been. And, and God in this moment was seeing that we weren't doing that because we thought that our money was our source. And he didn't want that. We had placed that more security in that than we had in him. And so what, in our praying, we got desperate and, and we had nothing else to do, and we prayed, which really should seem like the instinctive first thing that you do, but sometimes it, it just isn't. Sometimes it's like the last thing that you, that you do. And to be honest, Kristen gets there a lot faster than I do. I, 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 I struggle with that one sometimes of just being real and honest and truthful with God. But at this moment, in, in our living room, on our couch, it's, it's, it's all I had left, so we were... And God, we felt God speak to us. He said, I want, and again, like I tell you, we're going to be truthful. We're going to be honest. We're going to be personal. God said, I want you to tithe $460 a month. Are you crazy? What? That's what you want me to do? Like, I'm, I'm here telling you about all of my financial struggles, and now you want me to give more? Right? Like, I, I don't, can't afford that. And that's crazy. I'm a, I think that's what that woman would have felt that like at that time, where she's like, look, I'm going to do this, and then we're going to cook our food, and then we're going to die. And then Elijah, who was really God, talking through Elijah, says, whoa, 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 take care of me first, look for my house, and then all of these things will be added to you. I'll take care of everything else. 
And the woman trusted God. The widow trusted God. And we made the decision, we're going to trust God too. So we start doing it. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. But we start doing it because it's, it's what we could do. We always have something that you can do, and that's what we could do. So we start doing that. Time goes on. And uh, like I said earlier, we booked an appointment uh, a year prior consultation. And then we figured that we could for Kristen's veins, and they told us it was going to be $5,000. And we figured, okay, we'll book an appointment for a year in advance, and, um, and then we could save up the money by that point, uh, hopefully. But like no one predicted, a pandemic happened. And whatever money that we had saved up got used up in whatever it gets used up in. Things were needed around the house. Kids needed things. You, you're feeling depressed and anxious and sad, so maybe you spend a little more. And we were in a position where we, again, we didn't have the money, but Kristen had gotten a phone call saying that they pushed elective surgeries back. So we thought, cool, we, we have more time to save up. So it was shocking a little bit when I came home on a Friday morning and the vein clinic had called Kristen and said, hey, your appointment is going to be a week from today as normally scheduled. I came home and she had this, this sad look on her face. And uh, you know, you walk in and you know something's wrong. And I was like, oh, what's, what's happening? She's like, the vein clinic called. And uh, I guess my appointment is next week, but I just, I know we have to cancel it um, because we don't have the money, but I just don't want to, right? Like I, I really think that God could come through for us. So we decided at that moment that, okay, well, it's Friday. Um, let's leave it today. Let's leave it all day. You know what I mean? We prayed again because we, we were feeling down and, uh, and a little hopeless and so, and desperate. So we prayed again. And so we thought, let's give, let's give God a, a, a <laughs> it, seems, it seems weird to say it, but let's give him a chance. You know what I mean? Let's rely on him as our source. We made that decision and, uh, and we'd been making it verbally and we've been making it physically and so we we had faith that, that something was going to happen friday goes on nothing nothing happens uh the, the clinic is closed now so we're going to wait the weekend saturday comes on comes through still nothing nothing happens and sunday we think okay this is the day before we decided we we're going to we're going to call the clinic we're going to cancel this appointment at 10 a.m on monday Sunday goes by, nothing comes. Monday morning goes by, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., nothing. 9 a.m. happens, nothing. Finally, at 9.45, Kristen has had, a, and I, both of us, we've had enough. We, it's almost like we want to be told yes or no. This whole limbo thing is, is really getting hard. So she's like, I'm just going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to call the clinic, um, and we're going to cancel, we're going to cancel this appointment, and I don't know how we're going to make this work, but... Um, I'm sure that God's going to provide some way, somehow, eventually. As she's, about to dial the, as she's about to dial the phone, a phone call comes in to us. And so I, I, we answered it, <laughs> I think hoping inside that, you know, it'd give us an extra couple of, like, minutes for God to do his work. You know what I'm saying? We weren't ready, really, to say no. And so this person comes in on the phone, and he's like, uh, you'll never guess what happened. And... We're, we're confused. We don't know what's going on. And he said, I, uh, I've been thinking about you guys. I've been doing some praying. And I just had a check come in our mail for $5,000. And we, we don't need it. We don't know what we're going to do with it. So we decided to pray and see what God wants us to do. And, uh, and then we couldn't get you guys off your minds. Like, so um, we're wondering if we could pay for your surgery for Kristen. And I... I, whenever this happens to us, man, I break down and I cry. And, and Kristen and I both had a cry in the living room together. And God, at the very last second, he waited to the very last second to come through for us. But that's, all, and, 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 you know, we could, maybe if I had more faith, we could have driven to that appointment and just hoped somebody run in at the last second and pay for us. But I didn't have that kind of faith. And God likes, it will meet you where you are at. We told God, we are going to cancel this appointment at 10 a.m. Tuesday, Lord, and at, or Wednesday, or Monday, and at 
15 minutes before, and as we were going to make the call, he came through and he provided for us. Fast forward a few months, you could probably see I have some new glasses on my face now, right? They came through that way, and, and the miraculous started happening in our lives. Our flour and our oil did not run empty, like this widow's flour and oil did not run empty. Worship team, I'll call you back up if you're, if you're close by. And God did the miraculous in our life because he is our provider. God is your provider. God is your source. So I don't know what your struggle is. Maybe it's a financial struggle and you're stressed out because your channels just aren't enough, right? Your streams of income aren't providing enough for you. And, and, you've, and you've, you're in this desperate, hopeless place that you don't know what to do. Well, my challenge to you is that perhaps you have confused your channel as your source, when it never was meant to be that. Your source is God, and God is the one that's going to provide for you. Maybe it's a health issue, and you just can't keep up with that. And you're stuck there, and you feel like you can't keep up. And you've confused something as your source, but it's really your channel. I would challenge you to, in your desperation, don't stay in your desperation. Pray in your desperation, and act in your desperation, and do whatever you need to do to place God as your source. But how do we do that practically? First, be honest. Be truthful. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. And pick somebody. Be honest with them. Let other people into your life in the things that you might be ashamed or embarrassed of that, uh, that you can't do or that in whatever your needs are. Secondly, act on it. Take the time that you need to hear God's voice so that you can know what your next channel is going to be, because it's never the case. It's never the case that he doesn't have one for you. And, it, and maybe the one that he has isn't as conventional as you thought it would be, like having to go to a widow for your sustenance, right? But it's there, and he's going to have it for you. So talk to somebody. Be truthful. Let God in. Let somebody in. Be honest. Put God as your source first. If you don't know what that looks like to do it, Ask him, slow down, take the time. God, I need another channel. Lord, I feel like it's been drying up and I can't keep up. And I feel like that widow where I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make a few more things of what, do what I can do and then I'm gonna die. Then it's all run out, Lord. He is there for you. Like, like we were saying earlier, God is your provider and he is your source and he is your sustainer and he'll sustain you.